When it comes to systems, you want something that will start showing results fast. You're looking for a tool that can enable your 3PL or warehouse to get to the next level. So why wait? That's why Carton Cloud provides supported, fast onboarding that can have your WMS up and running in hours, not months. Jump into Carton Cloud's easy to use workflows for all of your services, including cross docking, serialized inventory tracking, e-commerce order fulfillment, and more. This software is built by logistics people for logistics people, and those logistics people are standing by to help train you and support you so that you can be successful with your customer. With 24-7 real-time reporting and free online training, you need to check out Carton Cloud for your operation. Take the next step in your operation by heading to cartoncloud.com slash free dash demo or click the link in the show notes. The New Warehouse Podcast, hosted by Kevin Lawton, is your source for insights and ideas from the distribution, transportation, and logistics industry. A new episode every Monday morning brings you the latest from industry experts and thought leaders. And now, here's Kevin. Hey, it's Kevin Lawton with the New Warehouse Podcast, bringing you a new episode today. And today I'm going to be joined by Nick Bartlett. He is the director over at CBIP Logistics, and he's going to be joining us all the way over from Hong Kong. He's actually in the future right now. I'm just starting Monday. He's ending Monday. So we're going to talk a little bit about CBIP Logistics. We're going to talk a little bit about the D2C market in Asia and a little bit about what's going on with the minimis and also how CBIP has been focused on going carbon neutral in the last year and the process into doing that. And then we're going to talk a little bit too about their in-house tech platform, which is just kind of rolling out in beta and what that means and, and why they're going in-house as well with it. So Nick, welcome to the show. How are you? Good. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you so much for having me on. Excited to be here. And uh, I can confirm that uh, the world did not end on this Monday. I'm still here. <laughs> so even though I'm ahead of schedule, I can confirm that nothing serious <laughs> has happened yet. <laughs> All right, great. Well, you heard it here first. The world has not ended, so it's great that Nick is joining us here, and definitely, definitely excited to talk to you about this and learn a little bit about what's going on uh, over there on that side of the world as well. But for people maybe that are not familiar, why don't you give us kind of a brief overview of CBIP Logistics and what it is that you all do? Yeah, sure. So CBIP Logistics, we're, we're a fourth party logistics provider connecting brands with some of the world's leading and logistic solutions around the world, really. So, so the idea with our whole business model is that we sort of bridge the gap between what brands need and what necessarily traditional 3PLs may or may not be able to provide. The best example of that perhaps is a brand that is you know, seeking expansion out of the US, is looking for to leverage a partner in, say, the Asia-Pacific region or UK and Europe or somewhere like that and is seeking sort of advice, local expertise, and doesn't necessarily want to lock themselves in with one specific 3PL contractor and can kind of work with someone like us to sort of provide them with a suite of options. That's really purpose-built and really design-led for the brand. You know, our whole sort of internal match is like that we represent the brand's promises. We don't represent a 3PL's uh, profitability line, mm. uh, really, or the transactional commodity services that a 3PL sort of would normally offer. So very brand-led, um, and as a fourth party logistics provider, we are still kind of a, and I, I kind of call us an unconventional logistics company. Mm. Yes, we, we are intrinsically involved from start to finish. We take full contract and operational responsibility for every aspect of the delivery that we offer customers. So we don't just match make and say these are the this are, these are the subbies that we think we should use. It's very much a sort of design, build and execute business model. And we've been running the business now out of Hong Kong originally since 2015 and working with sort of started working with smaller brands. And now we sort of average brands doing sort of between five and a hundred million dollars and supporting over a hundred brands globally, shipping across, you know, 160 odd countries or whatever it is. And we've got 15 domestic geographical locations. So 15 different independent locations that we're operating and servicing customers take advantage of this 4PL network that we've built and that we're working with. So really exciting to be speaking with more and more providers and customers in the US side, particularly as people seek expansion beyond 
their current domestic market. And I think that's an exciting time for brands as they, a lot of them mature now in the US market and are seeking kind of where is that next growth coming from. Right. And that's really where our business comes in. And, and we're excited to, to be able to have those conversations with brands, particularly here in Asia where, you know, there's, there's a lot of exciting growth coming and it's a great place to be if your product's the right fit. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's very interesting how you, you focused on that and are helping to create those kind of international expansions, as you mentioned there. So, I, I mean, talk to us a little bit about kind of what is the state of the DTC market in Asia right now? I mean, you know, what does it look like? I mean, there's a lot of conversation about, I guess, companies that are shipping into the United States using de minimis and things like that. But I mean, even just internally within Asia, I mean, how does the DTC market look over there? Yeah, so look, I think the, the great thing about, uh, the one thing I'd say that a lot of people don't understand about Asia mm. is it is quite far behind uh, the Western markets in lots mm. of lots of ways. A really good example is, you know, infrastructure. You know, there's not necessarily as much good infrastructure um, as a lot of the mature markets. Now, naturally, that is evolving quite quickly. And if you think about sort of logistics, it's, it's actually really similar. So progression around technology adoption, progression, uh, progression around sustainability initiative, progression around you know, the the way that the asset and the infrastructure inside the logistics industry has progressed is just not as fast as what you see in the US in particular as a, as a direct comparison. So as a result of that, kind of e-com has sort of also followed that similar route, you know, where it hasn't quite picked up. Now, this is excluding the likes of the mainland Chinese who have obviously been a massive e-commerce mm-hmm. pioneer uh, in the space and have really demanded both strong infrastructure because they are strongly encouraged and motivated by their own economy, which is manufacturing. Mm. So slightly different context for, for China. You'd almost remove them out of that this particular question. But, you know, if you look at kind of how is the, how is the East faring at the moment, certainly it is only picking up and gaining great growth. And it's becoming particularly notable in the markets where there wasn't as much technology adoption. So, you know, the, the online buying in places like Vietnam, Philippines, you know, Thailand, these, these places have taken a lot longer for adoption, you know, whereas American consumers have grown up with mobile phones and it's just kind of, it's just part of your life, right? You don't think natural. too much about it. Yeah. It's natural and the price points kind of work and the product suites kind of, you know, what people are looking for. But, you know, you, you go to Vietnam, it's different, right? Uh, you can buy most things that you need on in a local store or down on the side street or convenience has never really been like the center of the decision making. But now we're seeing this really good level of adoption coming through. And so what that's meant is that as e-commerce is ramped and it's become more popular, it's meant that the conversions have become higher, the infrastructure's got better, the technology's got better. You know, I can tell you that we've been, I've been living in Asia for 10 years. And when I first moved to Hong Kong to now, and this is Hong Kong, Hong Kong also sort of falls under the Chinese category in terms of kind of progression and, and commitment to econ. But, mm-hmm. you know, we have an equivalent of what of an Amazon here called, called HKTV Mall. It's just like Amazon, like it's a next day or same day delivery and, you know, literally anything you want, you can get it. And the whole whole, whole thing, that, that wasn't even here 10 years ago. So just to sort of show you that as an adoption, you know, food delivery wasn't here 10 years ago. You know, so all of these things sort of point towards this convenience becoming king. But that's also all supported by strong, strong development infrastructure, good technology advancements, and obviously catching up with the rest of the world because no one wants to be left behind, right? And the East is certainly (laughs) demonstrating real appetite. And I think the real big winners, uh, the really big winners, you know, are the big marketplaces, the cross-border marketplaces, the likes of Shopee, Lazada, more domestic marketplaces like Tiki in Vietnam. These types of guys are really starting now to show their true colours. They had a lot of money thrown into them very early. They had lots of struggles around profitability and getting to a point of whether or not they could sustain their business models. Uh, But now it's sort of because the volume is now sweeping in behind it Mm. um, as adoption increases, technology increases, infrastructure increases. Now it's like actually now we've got a really good business here. And, um, you know, and those guys that invested earlier are are now getting the dividends of it. And so all in all, I would say it's a fruitful time. We're certainly getting good year on year growth. And importantly enough, you know, I think what we're mostly seeing as well is a lot of brands actually wanting to come into the East. You know, a lot of consumers seeking products from outside the region where they may not have been able to get it historically. So, you know, American brands coming into Singapore or Hong Kong or the mainland or even into Southeast Asia or down to Australia. So great to see sort of that consumer demand is now being pulled the other way. So 
It's not just about now a place where people go to get stuff made and then it all goes to America. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now it's like it's, it's, it's now really circumventing and we're seeing some great brands come out from the East as well. And, you know, brands that we some, some of which we support and some of which we, we, we cheer from the sidelines, but some great stories mm. coming out of some awesome brands uh, from the East. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to hear how that kind of advancement is, is growing more, more rapidly now and how it's developing within that. And I think it makes sense. Like you mentioned, you know, there's such a, a manufacturing base there and, you know, a lot of the e-commerce brands that are, you know, big in, whether it's the, the UK, Europe or the United States, I mean, a lot of that manufacturing is, is happening there. Right. So, so why not, you know, also try yeah. to serve that same market where I'm sure, you know, if you're manufacturing within the same country and then selling within the same country, I mean, it's going to, you know, the cost is going to be a little, little lower than trying to get it overseas as well. So yeah. tell us a little bit about maybe kind of like for a Western brand, right? I mean, how do they kind of look at expanding into the Asian market and, and when does it really make sense to do that? Yeah. So look, th this is such a big question because there's, there's so many facets to this particular question. And, and I think honestly, like it sounds cliche, but it feels like every story is different, you know, but, but the first, you know, I think I, I sort of break it down into sort of like three or four sections whenever we're talking to brands, right? Because for us, obviously, like a key aggregate or a key marker for us of whether or not a customer would be a good fit for us is do they have ambitions to go beyond their current four walls? Mm. And if they do, then kind of what is that ambition driven by? Is it just driven by, you know, people that, you know, some some brands honestly just say, oh, because it would be cool to be there. And it's like, okay, well, yeah, that's cool. But, but you know really like this. Yeah. It takes a lot to set up a new market, right? It's like going to live in a new country. Mm. Um, you don't just show up and it works. Um, you've got to work hard. You've got to do your homework about where to live. You've got to, you know, make friends. You've got to speak the language. You've got to adapt your adapt your style and adjust to culture um, norms. So the, the one thing I always say to people is like, well, what is the data telling us? You know, what is a lot of brands have organic growth within their customer base. And that, that organic growth is often the, the best place to start with. What is the data telling us in terms of, mm -hmm. hey, we get a few orders for, for China, we get a few orders for Singapore, we get a few orders for Japan, Korea. And, and a lot of the time, they kind of go dismissed, like, oh, 99% of our orders are the US, but we get 1% goes to Japan. Mm -hmm. and then it's like, well, that's that's odd. Why? Why is it Japan or why is it Hong Kong or why is it Singapore? So I always sort of say to people, you know, first and foremost, be led by what you do see organically. And if you do see that there's some appetite, then, then great, right? Be led by that as your first instinct on where to look. Now, people that just have like a blanket strategy, I think for a brand less than kind of, you know, less than 20 million a year in, in, in revenue pro probably should think twice. You know, I think just going with blanket is a bit ambitious. I think you really mm -hmm. need to sort of start somewhere. And if you look at some of the best brands, their strategy for expansion is they make the product relatively scarce, even in places where, they kind of still got a bit of demand, like small, small, more, small amount of demand. Like, oh, hey, we now ship to, but we don't ship to everywhere, but we ship to this part, yeah. which is closer to where you might be. And and I think that type of adoption is good because one, it, it limits the resources required to invest in a new market, but it also means it kind of keeps your other customers knocking on the door. Like, hey, mm. you're selling in Singapore now. Like, why are you not selling in Hong Kong? That's always a common, common one, you know? So first one would be like, understand your, that organic, what's the organic data telling us? Second one is once you do kind of decide on what that market might be, you really need to, to go there. You need to go and see it for yourself. And I know that that, again, might seem a bit silly, but you don't move somewhere without going to see it first, do you? So why yeah. would you expect your consumers to, to, to be any different, really? And a lot of the time we're speaking with brands that they just don't have any context for the market, right? You speak to someone about, you know, delivery, last mile delivery in Australia is – surprisingly complicated. It's very like the US. There's lots of similarities. It's big. It's highly matrix. None of the carriers cover the whole country. They all use each other. And the prices are pretty absurd in some areas. They're more competitive than others. So the whole the whole dynamic of just the last mile delivery, like go and see it for yourself. Go and experience getting a delivery locally. Go and see what your sort of customers would would feel. So we, we always encourage people to come and see us or, or any vendor they're talking to. But really get that context for the market, understand what consumers are looking for, what they're like. And also, most importantly, like what is the local experience that you want to build for the brand? Mm. Because there's a real lack of localization when I look at international expansion. There is just very little given to 
hey, we're speaking to an Australian customer now and mm. we need to adjust our style and show them that we're an American brand, but, but we get them and we're relating to them and we know them and we can deliver our product in a way that will be that will resonate well with them. Mm. So that sort of number two was kind of that really do your research. And again, it might seem really simple, but my, my advice for the research is not like go on Google and see what it <laughs> says. Yeah. My advice is like, Get in there and get into the feeds and like experience it. Go and go and see it. Do it. If you're really committed to the market, you got to do it. The third thing is like, don't be resource shy. You just cannot do an expansion if you're willing to be resource shy. And what I mean by that is like not putting enough people on it, not really being committed to it. Again, we see lots of brands with big ambitions. Their product could really do well, but they just don't put the resources into it. And then they put a lot of emphasis on their partners. And often the partners are just kind of flying blind, different time zones. No one's available for calls. And all of a sudden it, it falls over. And, and I think if you don't, it's just like anything, right? If you're going to do it, do it properly. Don't do it. Don't yeah. do it half, half hearted, you know? And, and that's, that's a big one for expansion. And then the last one's probably just, you know, sort of a bit of a tip to finding the right people to work with, I guess, you know, mm. because, you know, local partners, local knowledge, all of that stuff's critical. And one of the things that, like, I love that we do, and I know other 3PLs and stuff do this as well, but, like, we, we always encourage the brands to come out and just just hosting them, right, showing them around, taking them for drives around the city and showing them different brands. I, I find that works really, really well. Everyone kind of leaves those meetings with fresh perspectives and a bit of appreciation for kind of what's required to be successful in that market, mm. as well as a chance to get a feel for, like, the lay of the land with different vendors as well, right? Because obviously, you know, the market's full of vendors and it's really hard to decide sometimes. Like, who do I go with? That guy sounds nice on the phone, but, yeah. you know, <laughs> don't know what he's going to be like in three months. And, <laughs> you know, so, so I think, you know, finding the right path is key. But how do you do that? Again, you've sort of got to just be all in committed and get out to these places and see people and, and invest. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think it's interesting to, you touched on there kind of, you know, how do you, now, like maybe there's some interest there in that market, but how do you make sure that you're you're really kind of catering to that market? Because it's it's going to be a little little different. The the customer and the, the culture as well, and then things like that are going to be different, and how those things are gonna gonna operate. So, I mean, in that sense, I'm curious, like you know, what is the because here, you know, in the United States where I'm at, obviously, like Amazon has certainly set a, a precedent for for delivery time and things like that. I mean, as you know, e-commerce is continuing to evolve over on that side of the world. I mean, you know, are those expectations still there? I mean, what what's, I guess, what's important to the, the consumer there from like an e-commerce perspective? Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's surprisingly not orientated around speed of delivery. Mm. Yes, of course, everyone wants to get it quickly. I, th I think the thing that really probably drives a huge amount of the success of brands is around trust. Mm. And trust in an Asian culture is of the highest yeah. sort of qualities, of one of the highest values that is positioned, right? So I think also if we're going back to that original question, like w w why has Asia been a bit slower maybe with mm. their adoption? I think part of it is that it's like, who am I giving my credit card to? Who are these people? Are they mm. going to scam me? Like, What's going on here? Whereas the US is it's a tightly regulated market. The banking sector has got every lots of eyeballs on it. You know, it's not like you can get away in the US with, with scamming people as such. I, I know it happens, but certainly not yeah. not the same way it happens in the East. But so I think, you know, that that's a really big one is is kind of how do you build that trust? And that's kind of why that localization, showing that you understand, showing there's some trust factors there. That, that's re really important, right? I see lots of brands trying to get into the mainland of China. And look, honestly, it's tough. Like, yeah. and I'm not a brand owner, like, <laughs> you know, so yeah. I, I've only got, I've only got admiration for these guys that try and do it. And I know there's, you know, there's, there's loads of trading partners. They're called TPs. They help you get into all these different sales channels like Timor and, mm -hmm. you know, they can list your product on all these different places and promise you a billion eyeballs. And, and it, it's massively complicated. But the, the, the really tricky thing is that it's a completely, different game, different marketing channels, mm. different um, communication style, you know, complete localization of the product. You know, you've got to speak about your pro product like you're a robot, you know, because mm. that's what they respond to, right? They don't respond as much to all of the emotional factors that we in the Western world relate to when, when we're selling products. So there's just, there's so many nuances that are just like hidden that you can't even see that you really need to kind of adjust to. And I think if you're a brand, the things that you've got to do in order to kind of build, build customer confidence 
localization, building trust, building credibility, showing you're the real deal. Because whilst a lot of people want an American brand in their home, like mm-hmm. or, or or any Western brand doesn't have to be American, but they kind of want it in their home, you know, because they want to show they've got a Louis Vuitton bag, a, you know, a, a European bag or a you mm-hmm. know, Nike, whatever it might be, right? So it, all of the, if you look at the guys that have done well, a lot of them have done done exactly those three things. You know, they've they've localized well, they've built trust well, and they've executed very much in that in that local context frame of mind, that local context culture versus just kind of going, oh, I've got a cool product, I'm going to sell it. You know, very, very, very few brands can just say, I've got a great product, just going to sell itself. Mm. And they don't have to do anything, right? Very, very, very few. There might be a few exceptions. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to hear kind of the the differences from like the cultural aspect of how how the market reacts to the products and what they're they're expecting and what's like important to them. I think that's pretty interesting. And so you, you mentioned earlier too, that you, you kind of had to focus on the sustainability aspect too. And then, and then that has been kind of slow within the market, that market as well, but you guys are carbon neutral as of last year, right? So tell us a little bit about that kind of what went into the process of making that happen and then also, like, I mean, just why is that important in general for, for you to accomplish? We'll be back after a quick break. I hope you're enjoying this episode. Do you want more warehouse content delivered to your inbox? Sign up for our new email series called Warehouse Wisdom Wednesday to get an educational series of emails on warehouse basics delivered directly to you every Wednesday morning. Find the sign-up link in the show notes. Yeah, maybe I'll start with why it's important. So, so you, you might hear it in my voice, but I'm from a small country in the South Pacific called, called New Zealand. Mm. And I grew up with our other director, the other founder of the business. We, we just had like the most idyllic childhoods, really, you know, mm. blue water and blue skies and mountains and, you know, beautiful hiking and fresh water and I never ever had any consideration for the planet other than that it was perfect, you know, as, as a kid, because coming from a place like that, you're just spoiled, right? We were spoiled. Yeah. Absolutely no two ways about it. And a lot of people think it's crazy now that I live in, <laughs> in Asia. Yeah, why'd you why, leave? why would yeah. I give <laughs> yeah, why would I give up the blue lake for, for this? Yeah. This pollution. But but there's there's always a trade trade off, of course. You know, so so for me, contextually, I came from a place that with the planet, you know, with with the earth and, and, and the, the environment that we lived in was 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 pristine, right? And the New Zealand government has always been so strong and, and activate sort of, you know, promoting and taking active steps to maintain mm. the, the the beauty of New Zealand. So I think contextually for me it was sort of like I'm from this place, it's always good kind of and we came here and it was sort of the complete opposite. Mm. And, you know, when I talk about opposite, I mean like recycling here is like you put it in recycling bins and then they just put it all together. <laughs> um so, so, so it's kind of like it's it's kind of like on the facade it's there mm. but as soon as you pull back the curtain it's it's not there yeah and the adoption of sustainability has been really slow and because we're a carbon contributor because even though we're not the asset owner we don't operate the trucks and the vans and the planes and the the ships you know we, we certainly are still contributing intrinsically to, to that by selling our services and, and trying to consolidate our brand's efforts across their supply chain with their logistics. And as a result of that, we felt that we had a responsibility to take a position on that. That was both good for our own centred value, so like good for, good for Chris and I as owners of the business because mm. we cared about it, but also because we know that the brands that we want to work with also care about it. And I think that was really the tipping point. It was like we really want to just partner with brands that do care. You know, of course, we understand that not everyone's going to be at the top of their priority list, but... Mm. Certainly, we find like if it's a top three thing, then then that's a that's a really contributing factor to how we can collaborate more effectively together. And in terms of how we did it, how we got to carbon neutrality and all of that, I mean that's a really rigorous process. So we partnered with a sustainability consultancy based out of Singapore, and effectively they help you to um, audit your business. Uh, it's a bit like a um, I don't know if you're familiar with B Corp, like the B Corp certification. Yeah, sure. It's sort of like, you know, there's a there's a fairly rigorous kind of set of auditing that is required. And they look at everything from, you know, what are you contributing across different scope, scope levels of emissions. So there's like scope one, scope two, scope three, and there are in each side scope, in each one of the scopes, there are different levels of emissions. And we had to figure out kind of where do we sit in those levels. 
we then had to look at all of our activity, like our office, how we got to the office, our internet travel, how much our warehousing across our portfolio of warehouses and suppliers, which is around 55 suppliers globally. We had to audit all of them and say, hey, we need all this information. Can you help us from, from you know, power energy, water energy, hours of operation, you know, all of these things to try and help build some assumptions so we could, so we could gather you know, how much of our business inside our suppliers were we having an impact on? Mm. And at the end of all of that, that took like us about a year to do that, all of that work, like about nine, 10 months. And because obviously we're relying on a lot of external parties to provide us that information. So so it took a bit longer than we would have liked. And then from there, we've published our first report in 2022. And then technically you're not carbon neutral for a whole year after that because mm. you then have to like go through the actual offsetting phase once you've actually done your audit. And once we did the audit, we've just released, just about to release our 2023 report. So we've done 2021, 2022, and now we're just about to release 2023. And 2023 will technically be our first year of being yeah, fully, fully carbon neutral because we offset everything nice. from the previous year and, mm. and the year of. So certainly the big piece around this around this whole sustainability thing is that, yep, carbon neutrality is great mm. and it's good and it's healthy and it sounds good. But fundamentally, it's really only the first step, but certainly certainly um, from a process perspective, it's been really rigorous and we wanted it to be really credible and we want it to be fair and we wanted it to be transparent as much as we could make it. Mm. And that's kind of where we've landed on it now. We're still learning, like it's a big learning curve. Like me and Chris knew nothing about this stuff before we started. <laughs> um, you know, e- even learning how to buy carbon credits, like who would have thought that I'd be running a business and trying to buy carbon credits at the same time? So. Mm. You know, it's sort of, you know, the world is moving quickly, but I think the number one thing is that it's important to us personally. And then it's also, we, we know that the brands of tomorrow, mm. it, them and now if we take a stage, you know, we're a really, really early mover, early mover in Asia. You know, like I said, adoption yeah. of sustainability is effectively negligible. You know, it's there, but it's not there, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really interesting to hear kind of the the origin of, of why you wanted to do it. And I think that makes total sense. And I, and I think too, I think it's a great thing because you're really kind of setting the the foundation as that kind of expands. But even as like, you know, Western brands want to expand into the, the Eastern markets, I mean, you know, that's important to them, right? It's more important in the, the West, I guess you could say, you know, based on what you're telling us about some of these things. And, you know, I, I think that goes a long way and being able to continue that through the entire supply chain. So it'd be really interesting to see how that kind of develops and how you guys, you know, kind of start the movement over there a little bit in a, in a sense, being early yeah, I adopters. Mean, I yeah. mean, a good, a, a good example to compare it to would be like the EU regulations that are just about to yeah. drop, you know, like you've literally on one side of the planet, you've got, you know, the European Union putting together like fully regulated, like reporting standards that you must meet and you'll be like, find if you don't do it yeah which is effectively like paying tax and then on the flip side you've got you know a market that it's still like the wild west you know it's like yeah you can do it if you want but you know no one's probably going to believe you people might think it's greenwashing how yeah. legitimate are you <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> and yet and yet all the stuff coming into the eu a big chunk of it's coming from the east yeah so there's there's quite a lot of irony uh, about the progression you know because you know obviously there are different countries running completely different paces of the race yeah yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it'd be interesting to see how that kind of continues to to evolve and how does, you know, these countries and uh, continents, I mean, how they kind of like align on this some, somewhere in the future, right? I mean, hopefully there is some alignment somewhere in the future, definitely. Um, yeah. So very yeah. interesting to hear about that and kind of the, the process and the, the journey that went into that. And now you guys are also focused on your in-house tech platform, which I believe is, is kind of in beta right now with some of your customers. But tell us a little bit about what does that entail? And I think also, too, I'm curious, like, you know, why, you know, there's so many softwares, tech out there in the world. You know, why also the choice to kind of go in-house with it as well? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was one we debated for ages. I can, I can tell you that <laughs> when you look at the cost of doing it yourself. But yeah. certainly for us, we've always relied on white labeled third party software right up in, from day one. We've been really transparent about that. It's not our technology, it's not our proprietary software. So that, that means a couple of things. One, it means that we don't have much control. It also means that we don't have um, much agility when it comes to specific, you know, specific requests or, you know, or, or needs that, that we have. Um, so that sort of 
those, those couple of things kind of over eight years and trying to build and scale the business to be more efficient, those two things really kept coming back to, hey, our business model was not really fit for anything that's available in the market and on a on a totality perspective. There are aspects that absolutely are, you know, auto management, warehouse management, you know, all of those aspects are, right? there, there are aspects that are there, but there's no one control tower. And, and we've called the product bundle because the idea is that, you know, we're sort of bundling the operations of our customers together. And, and I think the really unique thing about our, about our offering is that we're a traditional asset owner seller. You know, so we're not just trying to sell the four walls of the shed or three sheds or four sheds. You know, we're, we're trying to really deliver on the brand's promise. And part of that is everything from post-production to the minute it's finished right down to getting it to the consumer door. And we want to offer the brands that, that bundled operating tower. And we felt like the best place to do that was rather than relying on, I think we were using three pieces of white label mm. to deliver the operation. And that just, that anyone in technology will tell you that, you know, what you should do is just build something over the top of it or, or look at how you can consolidate away from having three systems. And so, so big, big part of it was that really in terms of why we did it. And, and what it is and, and what it is really is fundamentally it's, it's not an operations tool so we, we've not mm. built a wms we've not built the ground up operating systems because we don't we don't need that because all of our subcontractors have got that yeah. all of our partner network has got that so what we need is we need the power of the data uh, coming in from multiple sources both with, with our customer because sometimes obviously we custom we might feed into a, a customer's factory or their erp system or their storefront so we needed the ability to be able to kind of feed that information, that critical information into us. And then we wanted to have the, the ability to have the system do all of the heavy lifting on the automation in terms of mm. this particular piece of data needs to go to the subcontractor for this particular action. And that really, in my opinion, is the power of the of what we're building. And it's we're building that across you know, 50, 60 vendors through a fully API-driven platform. And, and that will enable both a really systematic help for us as an operation but it will also enable a whole bunch of benefits for our customers because now instead of having to have, you know, I, I know that there's aggregation platforms and there's lots of, you know, 3PL has, you know, their, their sales channel and then they have like 100 couriers, but it, all of that is limited to that one asset owner, whereas now we're opening you up to not just that one asset owner, but, but our 55 asset owners and, and, their, and their respective networks. So it really is kind of almost creating like another layer of options for our customers to choose from, as well as obviously our own direct contractors, direct contracts as well that we hold, that we hold with some carriers as well. So it means that we can kind of we can kind of play around a bit more effectively with the technology, and then from from here we're hoping that the technology will enable our customers to have a superior experience because it's it, like I said, it's not an operating platform; it's more of a so sort of that gathering and allocating tool, and then that mm. will tell us a whole bunch of things. We'll be pulling insights from all of our respective uh, suppliers as well as from customers, and we'll start using the data, and hopefully over time we'll, we'll build up a, a decent pool of data, and, and from there we might be able to do more and more insights and offer more value both for existing and new customers in the future. Mm. Yeah, I think that's great, and I think that you know perspective on it and, and looking at it in that, that way to develop it so that it makes sense for kind of this, I guess, ecosystem that you're, you're developing with all these different different partners and, you know, contractors. I mean, I think it makes sense to, to bring it all together and, and develop that in the way that makes sense for, for you and for, for the brands that want to work with you and, and go through you. So it's really interesting to hear how you've thought about that and how you're kind of developing that now. And I'd uh, be interested to hear how that continues to, to evolve into the, the yeah. future as well, especially as the, the market continues to evolve over there as well. So super interesting talking to you here, Nick, today and, and learning about kind of the, the Asian market over there and C, CBIP logistics as well. And kind of all those different nuances come from the East compared to the, the West and, and all those different things. So if people are interested in learning more about CBIP logistics, what's the best way to do that? So you can just find us at cbiplogistics.com, nice and easy. Or alternatively, you can find me on LinkedIn, just at Nick Bartlett. I'll probably search Hong Kong, maybe. There might be a few Nick Bartlett's um, out and <laughs> about. Uh, or alternatively, you can find me on Twitter as well, Nick underscore Bartlett CBIP as well. Drop a like or a follow or whatever you'd like to do. But yeah, certainly we're always up for a chat and, and really appreciate the chance to be on the show, Kevin. And great work that you're doing, sharing, getting getting all these guests on and having so much good knowledge shared um, with your audience as well. It's just really, really good to see just the quality of, of episodes and stuff that have come out as well. 
All right. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And we'll definitely share all that information about CBIP Logistics and Nick as well at thenewwarehouse.com so people can easily find it. So Nick, thank you once again for your time on the show today. You've been listening to the New Warehouse Podcast with Kevin Lawton. Subscribe and check us out online at thenewwarehouse.com. enjoyed this episode make sure you are subscribed to the podcast and for more content from the new warehouse find us on linkedin and youtube links to subscribe can be found in the show notes and for everything the new warehouse head to the